Hello everyone. Today, I want to make a statement, nay, an impassioned plea, regarding the importance of stressing biodiversity when teaching about evolution. So, let's jump right in. There are between 10 and 30 million species alive on this planet. Most of those species are, let's be honest, things the average person doesn't care about. They're not charismatic megafauna like elephants or tigers, not brightly colored birds or fish. Heck, you probably can't see most of them. The large majority of species are either microscopic, being bacteria, archaeans, or protists, or if they are macroscopic, they are beetles, nematodes, mollusks, or some other invertebrate. However, even if you don't think about them very often, they do indeed play huge roles in the environment. That's a topic for an entire video. Regardless, today I want us to think about biodiversity in the context of teaching evolution. Charles Darwin didn't have access to a lot of fossil organisms. Instead, he only had modern organisms to look at to draw comparisons. For example, in Chapter 4 of Origin of Species, Darwin says, quote, and it is in fresh water that we find seven genera of ganoid fishes, remnants of a once preponderant order. And in fresh water we find some of the most anomalous forms now known in the world, as the Ornithorhynchus and Lepidosiren, which, like fossils, connect to a certain extent orders now widely separated in the natural scale. Close quote. For reference, ganoid fishes are sturgeons and gars, which are among the most basally derived extant ray finned fish. Part of their plesiomorphic morphology comes from retaining a portion of a respiratory system involving lungs. Lungs, by the way, are a primitive or plesiomorphic character in both ray and lobe-finned fish, but were later lost in ray-finned fish, eventually evolving into the swim bladder. On the other hand, Ornithorhynchus is the platypus genus and Lepidosiren is the South American lungfish. Even back in Darwin's day, naturalists recognized that the platypus shares features in common with reptiles, such as egg-laying, which is actually a plesiomorphic character in mammals. And Lepidosiren has lungs like amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, as well as thin, wispy fins that look like limbs. Darwin recognized that an animal similar to Lepidosiren was probably ancestral to tetrapods, and in the intervening century and a half, various fossils have confirmed this conclusion. But we do have a lot of fossils now. We can see the evolutionary history of various lineages throughout geologic history, phytoplankton, arthropods, tetrapods, and many others. Having transitional fossils helps immensely in explaining the concept of descent with modification. After all, you can point to a clade, like, say, Equidae, or the horses, and show how gradually the lineage changed over time. We can see small five-toed horses were first followed later by three-toed horses, and eventually one-toed horses. This was not a straight progression by any means, but we can still see how changes gradually accumulated, leading to vastly different forms. Hierarchotherium is quite different in a number of ways from the modern equus. Famous examples like this are great. However, the extent of extant biodiversity is often tragically left out in discussions about descent with modification. What I mean is there are some highly speciose lineages alive today that we tend to ignore because they're not super charismatic, but they are excellent with regard to demonstrating evolution. For example, some organisms fall into what are known as species, complexes, or aggregates because the species barrier is very fuzzy. Darwin says regarding this in Chapter 2 of Origin of Species, quote, Many years ago, when comparing and seeing others compare the birds from the separate islands of the Galapagos archipelago, both one with another and with those from the American mainland, I was much struck how entirely vague and arbitrary is the distinction between species and varieties. Close quote. This shouldn't come as a surprise. Recently, a paper was published that discusses this concept of a speciation continuum, linked in the description. Of course, most extant species are not descended from any other extant species, except those who underwent very recent speciation events. 
Similarly, highly specious lineages tend to have broadly similar body plans, but with variations due to particular selective pressures or historical contingencies. This way it's easy to highlight both the obvious similarities and differences among related organisms. If people can understand this concept on a small scale, such as between two sister species, then they can also apply this concept up the taxonomic ladder. An example of this that we recently discussed on this channel with the help of Dapper Dinosaur is the seahorses and their pipefish cousins. If you want to know more about pipefish and how their evolution eventually culminated in seahorses, then go check that video out. Today we'll take different examples though. Let's take a different fish family, Acantheridae, the tangs. Tangs are identified by their deep compressed body with eyes high on the head and a long preorbital bone. Additionally, they have sharp caudal spines with which they can slash open would-be attackers, hence their informal name, the surgeon fish. So we have a set of characteristics that unite the tang family, but we can see here that these characteristics have been adapted in various ways. In this picture, we have four tangs, starting at the top right and going clockwise. We have the lavender surgeon fish, sailfin tang, unicorn fish, and blue tang. We can see their overall tang body plan, but in different shapes and colors. Serranidae, the groupers, have an operculum bearing three spines as well as three spines on the anal fins. In this picture, going clockwise from the top right, we have the panther grouper, gold ribbon soapfish, Atlantic goliath grouper, and sea goldie. Clearly, the sea goldie is substantially smaller than the Atlantic goliath grouper with a totally different color and niche. Another example, Pomacentridae, the damselfish, have a deep and compressed body with a small mouth, interrupted lateral lines, anal fins with two spines, and no palatine teeth. In this picture, going clockwise from the top right, we have the blacksmith, cocoa damselfish, green chromis, and clownfish. Again, there is a huge variety of colors in this clade. Now, let's travel to a completely different clade. Closely related to the insects are a few clades of arthropods, one of which is the order Kalimbala. In this picture, going clockwise from the top right, we have a representative of the families Isotomidae, Entomobriidae, Smintheridae, and Poderidae. The story is the same. All of these are similar in a number of ways. They have a colophore on their first abdominal segment, which is likely involved in water intake and excretion a tail-like furcula extending from the fourth abdominal segment, and a structure called the retinaculum on the third abdominal segment, which holds the furcula under tension. Of course, each of these is a member of a separate family within the same order, but just by looking at them, you can clearly see their outward morphological similarities. Finally, we'll take an example with plants. This time, I decided to take an example not within a family or order, but a single genus, Begonia. The genus Begonia contains some 1,800 species and a huge variety of flower shapes and colors. Since they are all in the same genus, clearly the only explanation for their variety is natural processes, except in the instances where humans artificially bred certain Begonias. Even still, the differences among the flowers are the result of changes in their genes, which in turn affect their morphology. In all the cases I've presented, these are organisms who do not get brought up in a lot of YouTube biodiversity discussions, but should be. The importance of teaching biodiversity is threefold. Biodiverse lineages can demonstrate how minor variations add up on small to intermediate scales. Variations in organisms are the result of natural processes like mutation and natural selection. And understanding biodiversity even helps in combating creationism. For example, creationists like to argue that there are clear demarcations between created kinds. However, they tend to only apply this concept to very limited groups of organisms. The reason is that creationists want the average person to think we know less about biodiversity than we actually do. By showing that relatively closely related lineages can look very different, or that relatively distantly related organisms can look similar, we can show the arbitrariness of the kind classification system. It is for these reasons that I believe anyone engaging in debates with creationists about evolution, or anyone making videos about explaining evolution to laypeople, should be broadly familiar with biodiversity. By being more familiar with biodiversity, we can both teach evolution and combat creationism better. 
We can also simply share the beauty of the natural world with others, which I hope will ultimately get people invested in preserving nature. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.